All right. Good morning, everybody. We are continuing a series uh, called Contrasting the Covenants. And so last week we talked a little bit about what a testament or a covenant was. And the short version of that, you can go back and listen to um, a little bit longer description, but the short version is uh, a covenant was how God related to his people and how he expected his people to relate to him. Um, we talked about a testament not coming into effect until the person who gives the testament actually dies. And so when we look at the New Testament, one of the questions I've always uh, had people ask me, they're like, hey, when does the New Testament begin? When does the New Covenant begin? And the truth of it is the New Covenant began before time existed. The Bible says in Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, talking uh, about the future and what God is going, he's going to wrap everything up like scrolls. There's so much in that book. But he also speaks to all the way before time began, he says, before time began, there was a lamb slain from the foundation of time. So before anything ever happened, before we ever needed a lamb slain, blood being spilled, before we even knew there was a need, the new covenant existed. And then as the covenants were given to the body of, uh, it, it begins with some men, uh, starts with Adam, the first one, right? Then it begins to, it works out into Abraham. Uh, you see it happening with David. Moses is the, you know, is what, what we call the old covenant, the big one, the law. But there are lots of covenants that God established, and they're all progressive, the progressive reality of what the new covenant was going to be finalized in when Jesus dies on the cross. So when does the new covenant begin? And the answer to that is not until the person giving the testament dies. So it doesn't begin till the cross, even though it began before the foundations of time. So there's challenges in that, which is why often people get confused. And if they're not careful, they end up walking under covenants that no longer apply to them. So uh, scripture talks about the old covenant uh, passing away, the law. Um, there's, you know, we talk about the Ten Commandments, but there's 613 laws um, if you put them all together. And so all of those laws were established to do something very specific. And we talked about that last week, about um, what, what the covenants were actually for. They had different functions. And so if you're interested in finding out a little more, more about that, you can go back and listen to that message. We talked about um, how they begin to be contrasted in John 1.17. Um, it's talking about, talking about Jesus, and it says, For the law was given through Moses. So the old covenant, the two primary ones, the old and the new, the old covenant the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So it doesn't mean there was no truth in the old covenant, right? It doesn't mean there wasn't grace in the old covenant. What it's saying is that, that the old covenant was established in the law and was beautiful. It's good, and we're going to get into that today. But at the end of that, something happened where the law wasn't done away with. It was finished and it was completed. So part of that is, has, has the law done its work in you? And so the question is, are you still living under the law or, you know, understanding how the law applies to you, how the, those covenants apply to you? So one question we asked last week was, why should you care? And so there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the implications, obviously, are pretty, ha are pretty big. But what, one of the big questions is, what happens if you sin? If you, if you become a believer, you believe in what Christ did on the, on the cross, you receive that, you trust in, you put your faith in, which means you trust him that he accomplished everything. It is finished, he said on the cross. You've trusted that, and now you become a believer. You get a new heart, a new nature. That begins, you're a brand new baby in Christ, and you begin a life of discipleship following your rabbi Jesus, right? What happens when you sin? Let's just be honest, not if you sin. <laughs> what happens when you sin? And it's a really, really good question, and so often we don't have the answer to that because we have, or, or if we're not careful, we end up living under two different covenants. We end up mixing the covenants, which is not something you can actually do and get away with. So it's really important to understand that. So I, I just want to ask a couple of questions, and we're going to revisit them when I get, get ready to close. Um, but here's kind of an indicator. Some of these questions are kind of an indicator of Maybe you're living under the old covenant when you are supposed to be living under the new covenant. Maybe you're mixing the covenants. Maybe you're not sure where you uh, fit in this whole thing. And so hopefully as we talk through today in this series, that we can wrap that up and help you really finalize this. And so here's the first question. Do you feel rejected, guilty, condemned, or unworthy? So, and it's a really good question, and one reason why is 2 Corinthians actually speaks to this, how the law, what the law is supposed to do. It says, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? 
So you see it's talking about, in that scripture, it's talking about two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. And listen to it again. If the ministry that brought condemnation. So what does the law do? (laughs) It brings condemnation. So if you feel condemnation, let me say it again. If you feel rejected, guilty, condemned, or unworthy, there's a really good chance you have placed yourself back under the law. Or maybe you have never become a Christian in the first place. Right? Because the law, we're going to get to that, what the law's job is and what it does in, here in just a second. Here's the second question. Do you think working out your salvation means working for your salvation? Are you trying to get God to love and accept you? Or do you believe he already does? <laughs> and so if you, if you have trouble relating to your father um, and, and you're like, I'm not sure he loves me. And especially when I sin some juicy sin or I fall back into a pattern of sin that I thought I'd done away with, and then you're like, okay, you know, uh, how do I feel about that, right? How do you feel when you're sin is a really good question. Third question is this, are you conscious of your debt to God? So think about that for a second. Are you conscious of your debt to God? And so just think of it this way. Do you think this unfathomable act of grace that God has given through Christ on the cross now obligates you to God. Is that how you think? Um, Do you think that he bought your debt and now you owe him something? Is that how you think? Some really good questions, right? So um, I want to start kind of with a a story. Uh, Watchman Nee, some of you guys know who who he is. He wrote, he's written tons of books, but he wrote a book called The Normal Christian Life. And if you never read it, it's an oldie but a goodie. I would suggest you go, go read it. He was a Chinese pastor and believer, theologian, um, writer. He did amazing things in China. And he was part of, he's part of one of the biggest networks of churches that China ever, ever saw. And they exist even to this, to this day. So he's a phenomenal believer. He had some incredible understanding of Scripture. And he taught it into um, what became the underground church in China. And so the underground church, when, it, when the communists took over was a certain size, a small size, and it had t- tremendous impact. And they had to un- go underground because if they, fi- if they found you worshiping Jesus, they would, they would murder you, right? So it's a, yeah, you don't want to praise God in public if, <laughs> if that's happening, right? Maybe you do. Maybe the Lord tells you to do it and you're going to be a martyr. That's fine. But outside of that, um, they would go into um, the houses and they would worship. And when they would worship, we had a friend who went and ministered to the underground church during that season. And he said it was the most phenomenal thing he would, he, he's ever experienced. He said because they would... They would, uh, they would bring him into a home, a large home, to preach the gospel, but he would show up really, really early in the day and wouldn't preach till that evening. And he said, and over the entire day, slowly, like a trickle, believers would begin to show up. Come, some come in the back door, the side door, the front door, but they would come in different places so they didn't come in a group so nobody knew that they were agreed, uh, coming. And then he said, by the time it was done, he said, there would be two, 300 people inside of a house. So he said they would literally be standing arm to arm like this in the entire house. He said, he said, every sermon I preached, he said, the congregation was this close to me. So he said, I was preaching to people and they could, he said, I felt for that one guy because my breath by the second time I preached was not great. And he was like, he was like, oh, Jesus, help this man. And thank you for everything you've done. Right. But he said, we would worship. And he said, this is how we would clap our hands silently because he couldn't do it. And he goes, he said, I would watch people worship and praise God. And he said, and the tears would flow and the presence of God would be so powerful in the room. And he said, and he would barely make a sound. And he even preached. He said, when he would preach, they told him to preach in a, almost like a whisper. And so he said, and this, this was the church that Watchman Nee helped build into. So a church that's not just survives during the communist, you know, challenges, but thrived during that season. That comes from a solid foundation. That's who Watchman Nee was. By the time it was over, the church had grown. um, Millions and millions and millions of people were believers. And it started out much, much less than that. So powerful guy. So this is something he talked about. We're uh, going to quote from him in just a minute. But um, he started the story about the law. And he said, the law, uh, if you can imagine a clumsy servant. And he said, so what happens with a clumsy servant is unless you ask them to do something, they look like they're amazing. He said, they're dressed for the part. They show up. Um, they're there. He said, but but the moment you ask them to do something, he said, they trip over the furniture. They drop the glasses. He goes, they just make a mess of everything. And you, and he goes in the whole time they look, you know, they looked the part, but the moment you ask them 
of something, asked something of them, they displayed their clumsiness. And so he goes on, he tells this story. He says, that's who we are under sin. And the way he puts it is really interesting. He said, if God asks nothing of us, we look amazing. <laughs> Everything's going well. But the moment God asks something of us, we display our clumsiness. And by that, he means we display our sin. So it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. But he said, the challenge is, he said, most of the time, the clumsy servant almost, well, it starts with all of the time. He said, the clumsy servant doesn't know they're clumsy. <laughs> and so the, illusion, or, or the allegory goes on and he talks about, it. he says, the problem is that we think we're free, but we're not. And so he talks about the law and uh, Romans 7 talks about this. And we're going to spend a little bit of time there. If you want to uh, open your Bibles, Romans 7, um, the law reveals our bondage to sin. So one of the things that it does. And so the way he explained it, he quotes um, Romans 7, 14. Let me just quote that in the Message Bible. He says, I know that all of God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. That's about it in a nutshell, isn't it? He said, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. So, so the picture he's painting is, as long as you do nothing, you're unaware of the fact that you're clumsy, right? The moment something is asked of you, it becomes obvious to everybody, including, hopefully including yourself. And so he goes on with the illustration. He says, it's, imagine a prisoner who is in a cell. <clears throat> he's been in there for a very, very long time to the point where he's now completely institutionalized. His cell is all he knows. To him, it's his home. And then the, the law comes along and says, hey, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know, but just outside these walls, there's freedom, there's beauty, there's every good thing. And so the prisoner says, you know what? I'm going to go out there and discover that. And so he runs as hard as he can to go outside to do it and runs smack into the prison walls and it knocks him down. And so the picture that Watchman Nee is painting is that we are the prisoners um, and our bodies are the prisons. In other words, he's saying the law does something to us individually. He said, we're, we're a prisoner inside of sin. We just don't know that we're a prisoner to it. And so what the law begins to do is it begins to reveal that. And the harder you run against the wall to try to be free, the harder you try to do something, the more clumsy you are, the more apparent that becomes, and the more the wall stands out to you and begin, you begin to recognize this is not my home, this is confining, this is keeping me from walking in the freedom that I thought I had when I was sitting still inside that prison. And so as you begin to try to do good, is a good example, you find that you can't do the good that you wanted to do. So this is one reason why we need the law. And so listen to this, it's really important. We need the law not to help us win against sin, but to help us lose against sin and quickly. And see, that's often not how we think of the law. We say, you know, we read the scripture, the law is good. And I'll look at it and go, well, it really is, it's amazing. The Ten Commandments come, and we're like, you know what, I should totally obey those. And, you know, that's freedom. I see that that's freedom, you know, and I'm going to go do that. And the moment I try to do that, the moment I discover I can't do that. <laughs> and I find myself a prisoner to sin, even though I thought I was a good person. And so this is the, the, the way that, that, that sin, or sorry, the way that law, the law begins to work in you and begins to help you uncover. Not that the law can help you um, walk holy. That's what you would think it would be for, right? Because it asks of you to walk holy. It asks of you perfection and complete 100% obedience. And in your heart, you long to do it. But as you try, you begin to discover that you cannot do it. So let me give you four purposes of the law. So the first one is just what we were talking about. The law reveals our sinful state. It draws attention to our confinement under sin. In other words, if we didn't have the law, we wouldn't see it. So Romans 3.20, um, you see Paul talking about this. He says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So one purpose of the law is to make you conscious of your sin. If you don't have the law, you don't know you're, you're sinful. If you've never been asked to serve as a servant, you think you're a great servant until you try to serve, and then you find out just how clumsy you really are. So before the apostle Paul comes to Christ, he talks about this process. So he said, I had a problem with coveting, right? But he didn't know he had a problem with coveting until the law revealed it to him. So you see this in Romans 7, first part of Romans 7, 7. He said, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. 
So again, the first purpose is it shows you what sin is. So what's part of the work of the law? You can't become a Christian. You can't be saved until you know you need saving, right? So how do we witness to people? How do we share Christ with people? If we come to them and say, hey, man, there's some really, really good news, and they go, that's awesome, and you don't tell them what the bad news is, or they have it, the law hasn't revealed to them what the bad news is, the good news makes no sense. If you say to someone, hey, somebody come and just paid off your entire house, and, uh, and it's completely paid for. And if they thought before that, you know, they weren't even making payments at their house, they were living in the house for free, they would say to you, thanks, but I don't need that, right? So the law is designed to reveal sin in us. So it's the same thing that happens with us in the same way that Paul received this. It's the same thing that happens to us. We don't know what sin is until the law tells us. We don't know we're not free until the law dares us to act free and we find we can't, right? So um, maybe you thought about that. Maybe you thought, you know, I'm basically a good person. I used this illustration when I started about how I always compare myself to people much, much worse than me, right? But the law, the law keeps me from doing that once I discover it because the law says there's only one comparison and the comparison is God. This is what he requires of you. How are you doing? And if you're honest, as you run headlong into that wall over and over and over again, you begin to recognize, maybe I'm not as free as I thought I was. So the second purpose of the law is to inflame sin. Now, this is an interesting one, especially if you're a believer, right? Because one of the challenges that we see, I've shared this before about us as pastors, we see people in sin, we love people, we want to serve people, we want to help them, so we disciple them, we speak the, the word of God to them, we preach to them, we do all these things, we encourage them, and we see them still in sin, and so our heart, because we love them so much, we don't want sin to have power over them, so we begin to preach to them about their sin. Right? And I, I did this in the early days. I would, I, would, I would preach about people's sin, right? And I'm like, that'll do it. So all I'm doing when I do that, though, is I'm just repeating the law to them. And if they know they're sinners, how am I helping that, right? I'm not helping that at all. All I'm doing is inflaming it. And you see this. So Paul says, you know what? I have a problem with coveting. Here's what I'll do. I'll stop coveting. I mean, how hard can that be, right? <laughs> so he's, he's thinking the problem solved, only the problem wasn't solved at all. As a matter of fact, um, Romans 7, 8 says this, to keep going in that passage, he says, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment. So let me say that part again. Sin, right? I don't know I'm a sinner. I think I'm okay. But sin, um, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. So he said, so the commandment, the law, takes, it uses sin and shows me how deeply sinful I am. And the harder I try, the more sin is inflamed. Why? Because it's trying to accomplish. The law was designed to accomplish something in us. The problem isn't the law. The problem is we're using the law for the wrong thing. And this is where we get in trouble. So if you've ever tried, I don't know if you've done this, but I have. If you ever tried to overcome sin in your own strength, you'll know that the harder you try, the harder it gets, right? So why is it? Why is it that the harder I try, the harder I fail? And the short answer is because you're relying on the flesh and the flesh is weaker than sin. Sin is more powerful than your flesh. It takes opportunity in your flesh, as a matter of fact, right? So what does that look like? Um, Romans, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Romans 5, 20, it says the law was brought in, why? So why did the law come? So that the trespass might increase. Did you know that? So, so imagine again, when the law is brought before the, the children of Israel, you know, I shared before, you see this in, in various parts, uh, Exodus talks about Leviticus. So he puts all these, these, these uh, Israelites on two sides of the mountain, right? With the valley in between. One side, he talks about the cursings, I'm mean, sorry, the blessings. And the other side, he talks about the cursings. Said, if you obey everything in the law, all the blessings will come to you. If you disobey one point in the law, one, James brings this out, one violation of the law, you are now a law breaker, right? And, and what we do is we try to soften that up. So like, I just, you know, I just missed it. I just, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal because <laughs> you now are a law breaker, right? And the whole point behind the law 
was to actually inflame sin. And the reason why is people thought they could do it. So on that mountain, he proclaims all of the law, the blessings and the cursings, and it is terrifying. The Bible said they, when the law was being given, the mountain was covered with, with um, smoke and lightning and thunder. And Moses was up there meeting with God face to face. And they're like, we don't want to talk to God face to face. You do it for us. And then you come tell us what he said. And so he does. And in all of their arrogance, they said, we will do everything you've said about the law. Right? And so God's up there. We'll see. <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm trying to explain to you what the law is for, so we'll see. And so they begin to try to obey the law. And the good news is he set up a sacrificial system because they were going to fail. Why do you put a sacrificial, think about this. Why do you put a sacrificial system in that plan if people weren't going to fail? Why do you go and kill the blood and you know, kill an animal and use its blood, right, to push back sin, the, the blood of an innocent lamb, obviously symbolic um, types and shadows? Why would you do that if people weren't going to miss it? And the answer was they were going to miss it. And so the whole story of Israel is we'll do it, and then they don't, and then they start recognizing, okay, this sacrificial system is super helpful. I'm so thankful that this has been made available to me. But it, it didn't last, and then the Bible says, and we're going to cap. We're going to talk about this the next time we come together. He talked about that the blood of bulls and goats, right, could never take your sin away. As a matter of fact, one of the things it could not do is it could not keep you from having a guilty conscience. And we covered that part of it. If you've ever felt guilty before God after you become a believer. What you're doing is you are putting yourself back under the law, and the law is beginning to do a work in you that ought to be finished. Right? So we're going to get into that a little more. So 1 Corinthians 15, you can go back and read it, and verse 56 talks about this. But it says, it basically, the reason why the harder you try to keep the law, the stronger sin becomes, is because the power of sin, is what 1 Corinthians 15 says, the power of sin is the law. <laughs> So if you're trying to get away from sin, what do you think the worst possible thing you could do is? Right? And we do it all the time. We hear the thou shalt nots, and this is what we say. We enter into our own newfangled sacrificial system. We say, oh, I screwed up again, Lord, and I know it's wrong, and, and I know because sin tells me that I'm sin, sinful. I mean, the law tells me that I'm sinful, so I'm like, I agree with that. Oh, yeah. And then I say, well, I will sacrifice by saying, Lord, this time I am serious. Last time I thought I was serious about stopping this, but this, this time I'm committed. Jesus, I'm going to do this for you because I love you so much, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work out my salvation. See what we do? And so we get caught up in this foolishness. And that's exactly what Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, he said, you foolish Galatians, right? Who, who bewitched you? Who put you under a spell to take you from the glorious gospel and put you back under the law? And yet they were doing it, right? So the problem isn't the law. We've said this before. The law, the Bible says, is holy, righteous, and good. What's the problem? You. You're the problem. <laughs> and the problem is, you are a sinner, but you don't admit you're a sinner. So the law comes along and says, here, I will help you by showing you your sin. And then when you try really, really hard not to be who you are as a sinner, then what does that do? It, it, the law inflames sin, makes it even more, and you find yourself trespassing even more. So if you want to solve the sin problem in a church, whatever you do, don't preach the law. Because if you do, what happens is it inflames everybody who comes back underneath that law and that church. You thought that church was sinful before? You should see it now. And this happens on a regular basis until it, pre, pre, it, it creates such legalism that it brings death. And that's the, that's the next thing we're going to talk about, the law, because that's what the law does is it brings death, right? So, um, you know, I've shared this before, but a guy came to me one time. He said, if you keep preaching, he was, he was a pastor. He said, if you keep preaching this grace, man, he said, your people are going to be involved in all kinds of sin. And I just laughed out loud on purpose, and said, I just think it's funny that you think your people aren't sinning. <laughs> right? So it's like that, and can I be honest with you? That's really difficult as a pastor. 
Because your heart is, man, I want to bring them freedom. I want to bring everything, you know, what God's done in me and, ex- and I've experienced, I want to do that. And the danger is oftentimes pastors have put themselves underneath the law. And they're living in legalism. So what do you think they're going to produce in us when, when they preach to us? So we have to be very careful as pastors. So here's the challenge. As sin's prisoner, you are simply not capable of freeing yourself. So here's, here's why that's so interesting. Um, there's a, a great Christian psychologist. His name is Henry Cloud. He uh, co-wrote a book called, uh, called Boundaries, one of the best Christian books of all time. The one book that I recommend as almost as much as the Bible is the book on boundaries. And the reason why, it's a practical understanding of how to live your life according to the way God's called you to live. To take the, the soul, the mind, will, and the emotions and that practical life that we live in on a re- regular basis. How to have boundaries in your own life, right? How to have healthy boundaries in your own life. And then how that turns into healthy boundaries in other people's lives. Which often helps those people, sometimes problematic people in your life. It actually helps them become healthy. Or if they choose not to become healthy, then they stop bringing damage to you and your family. So it's a really, really helpful book. But one of the things he said about, he said the worst term ever devised was the term self-help. And he said, here, uh, go, go to the bookstore, go to the library. The section on self-help is massive. Why? Because I'm, I'm fine. All I need is a little help, right? I just, I can do it myself. I don't need anybody. But, but you're saying that while you're reading somebody else's book. That's not self-help. And that's his point. There's no such thing as self-help. The whole nature of help is self can't do it by itself. It has to have help. So there's no such thing as self-help. You get it, right? And this is the understanding the law is trying to bring to us. You need something you don't have, right? So it's powerful. So the third thing that the law is here for, the third purpose of the law is to minister death. (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? That the law's purpose is to minister death. Listen to Romans 7.10. He says, remember, Paul's telling you about his journey through this. He tried the law, he tried all this, and it didn't work. He said, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life, right, actually brought death. So looking into the law and the perfect law and commandments, you're like, oh, that's so life-giving, except it's not. It was never designed to bring life. It was designed to bring death. He goes on, he says, Again, for sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment. Here's sin doing something. It's using the law to do it. He says, this is what it did. It deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. It deceived me into thinking I could do it myself. So I kept trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And turns out I never could. One more, Lord, just give me one more chance. In other words, I gave you the only chance you ever needed on the cross. Why do you keep asking for chances? See how it works? But, but it's so easy to get caught up in this. So the law ministers death. And how does it do it? it? It does it by demanding that we perform day in, day out, with no time off for good behavior. <laughs> right? Come on, sinner, try harder. Don't you want to do your best for Jesus? Doesn't that sound spiritual? Doesn't it sound amazing? Except it's the law. Don't you want to be free? Quit sinning so you can be free. Doesn't that sound great? It's awesome, except have you tried it? How's it going for you? And how it worked for me? And and Jesus made a statement. It's a very interesting statement. He said, if you fall on the rock, he's talking about him coming as the new covenant. And he's saying, so up until now, you've been given another covenant to show you your your need for a new covenant, right? We're going to get to that in a second. And he said, so now that you see your need for the new covenant, you have one of two options. You can fall on the rock. In in other words, you can recognize what the law has said to you, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that you cannot do it yourself, and if you keep walking in it, it's going to kill you deader and deader than you already were. So now you have an option. A Savior has been presented who has done every bit of the work for you. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He's the only one who ever fulfilled the law. The only one who ever will. And so he comes and he says, I offer myself as a sacrifice to you. Here's the cross. Here's the display for the whole world to see. As a matter of fact, it's so powerful. We're going to start time over on that day, right? (laughs) And then he says, so now I'm going to present to you your need for a savior. You can fall on the rock and be broken. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever fallen on a rock. I grew up in the foothills of the, uh, of the Smoky Mountains. I fell on rocks a lot, right? And, and thankfully, I never broke anything, but I felt broken even if nothing was broken. If you fall on a rock, it's not going to feel good. When you come to Jesus, I remember a, a pastor in Bible college said, and he, he was a, a contractor before he became a Christian. He said, you know what? Um, getting saved is like hitting your, hand, hitting your thumb with a hammer. And then he had this long pause, and I'm like, I, I can't even leave until I find out what the, how in the whole world is getting saved like hitting your, hand with, uh, your thumb with a hammer. And he said, it feels really good when it quits hurting. That sounds like contractor logic right there. But think about that. His point was falling on the rock is not a fun process. Recognizing that you are a sinner, that you can do nothing for yourself, that you are helpless, that you are in need, desperately in need of the mercy of God, that the wrath of God sits upon you because you've broken all the law. You are a lawbreaker and the law has been given and it's, it's judged you and you have found, been found wanting. And without Jesus, you have no hope. And, and now God says, come and humble yourself, right? Be broken on the rock. What happens if you don't break yourself on the rock? Jesus says, the rock will fall on you. So when judgment comes, and you haven't received this, when the rock falls on you, it will grind you to powder. That is a sober, sober picture. So what do we do? We come and go, wow, God, I see this. I lay myself down and I say, Jesus, I can't do it. I need your help. And that's that place of salvation, right? So the fourth and the finest, most amazing purpose of the law is simply to point you to Jesus. But there's a reason why to point you to Jesus and we've been talking about it. So that you may be set free from sin and never live in it again. But but Dave, I, I became a believer and I still sin. Yep. Are you a sinner? Well, I sin, so doesn't that make me a sinner? Nope. One of my, one of, one of my all-time, oh, I hate it so much when someone says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Boy, you sound so spiritual when you say that, except you're a liar. You have to be a sinner or you have to be saved by grace. You cannot be both of those things. And this is what happens if I keep saying, I'm just a sinner. I'm still under the law. The law hasn't done its work yet. I'm still deciding whether I'm, I'm going to be a sinner and continue to be in sin. But doesn't it sound so humbling and so beautiful about you? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Oh, you're so amazing. Praise your holy name. It's literally idolatry, right? Because in that, you're, you're saying Jesus' blood wasn't enough to actually save you. You're still a sinner. And the reason why, quite frankly, is because we preach this foolishness because we don't say to someone, when you are born again, you are a son. Maybe you're a good son. Maybe you're a bad son. When you're a baby, you do all kinds of baby things that need to be cleaned up by someone else, right? You can't, you can't even help yourself at that point. But are you a son? If you are a son, you are a son from here on out. Now, you can decide whether you're going to mature and become an adult son and, and walk in all the fullness of the inheritance that your father has given you. That's your choice, but you can never not be a son. And if we don't teach people this, people will stay under the law and they will never fulfill their purpose. They will never walk out their love for God because they're in this constant misunderstanding that God is still angry at them because they keep messing up. And you know, if they had really gotten saved, they wouldn't keep sinning. And like, you know, doesn't John talk about that? And, and it's all taking all these scriptures out of context and building this, this pseudo salvation that says, I can still live under the power of sin, but call myself a Christian. Or worse, I, I, I think I'm a Christian, but I keep calling myself a sinner. Which one is your identity? Are you a sinner or are you saved by grace? Because you can't be both. So again, so that you can be set free. So the law, this is Galatians 3. So the law was our guardian until. That word, that little bitty word is really, really powerful. The law was our guardian until Christ came. Why did he come? Why did the cross occur? That we might be justified by what? Our works? Our trying harder? No. What is faith? What is it? You're placing your trust in what Jesus did. Was it enough? Was the cross enough for me? Right? So you have to answer that question. 
So the ultimate purpose, Romans 6 talks about this, the ultimate purpose of the law is to point you to Jesus so that you can be set free from your sin and never live in it again. Look at Romans 10, 4. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Christ is the culmination. It's a powerful word. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who does what? Works hard, reads their Bible, goes to church, gives, believes, right? It's a powerful statement. So you know what? It, there, there's this big argument in Calvinism right now. You can find it all over the internet. Is you believing a work? Because you can't be saved by works. So is your believing a work? And so the, the, the argument is, you can, it, it beats you. Part of what it does, it tries to put you back under the law and just beat you down, beat you down, beat you down. Look, whether it's a work or not, that's, that's worth having a conversation around. That's fine. But the ultimate answer is, did you believe? You can call it what you want, but the scripture teaches that the only way to get released from underneath that prison of the law and sin is to put your trust in the blood of a perfect lamb that was slain before the foundations of time. Romans 10, this is the amplified version. My wife loves this. I call it the multiple choice Bible because it's kind of like a commentary in the Bible, right? It's a really good Bible, really good, good Bible to read. It says, remember, Christ is the culmination of the law. It says, for Christ is the end of the law. That's what culmination means, of course. And then it explains that in a greater detail. It says, the limit at which it ceases to be. So once the law met Christ, the law no longer had any power for those who believe in him. Why? Because he fulfilled it. He completed it. He finished it. It says, the limit at which it ceases to be, for the law leads us up to him, Jesus, who is the fulfillment of of its types and in him, Jesus, the purpose for which the law was designed to accomplish is fulfilled. That is, the purpose of the law is fulfilled in him. That's Romans 10 4. Go back and study, it's amazing. So, if you have believed, if you believed in what Jesus did on the cross for you to save you from your sins, if you've received him and put your trust in the finished work of the cross, the law for you has been fulfilled. So think about that. You have no further need of it. None. You can dismiss it as a good and faithful servant and thank God for the law and what it brought you to, but now you can dismiss it as a faithful servant. So the law is not your friend. <laughs> the law is, is, is not going to help you now that you are a believer as a matter of fact, if you put yourself back underneath it, it will inflame sin in you. And you'll find yourself walking in all kinds of sin you didn't even know you had in you. And the truth is, the Bible says sin is an element that waits at the door. And we're going to talk about this in the series as well. That it waits at the door waiting for someone to pounce on. How does it make its pounce? How does it jump on you? And the answer is through the law. Right? So, has the law done its work in you? That's the question you have to answer. So if, you're, if you say this morning, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, if you say that, my question to you, has the law done its work in you? Going back through those four points of the law, why the law exists in a different way, has it shown you that you are a sinner incapable of saving yourself? Did that happen to you? If you're a believer, did somewhere along the line the law show you that you were incapable of saving yourself? If the answer is yes, good. It's done its work, right? Have you finished trying to overcome sin in your own strength? Good. <laughs> Have you discovered your need for a Savior? Awesome. That's the whole point of it. Have you believed in the one that was sent? Because you can let the law do all of its work in you and get to the point where you have a need for a Savior and never call on that Savior. Listen to John 6, 28. It's one, it's one, it's one powerful scripture. It says, Then they asked him, Jesus, What must we do to do the works, plural, God requires? What, what's the question they're asking Jesus? What do, what do we have to, what are the, What's the law that we have to obey so that God will he'd be happy with us? He requires it. We recognize this. What are those? Can I just tell you they knew the answer? Right? They knew the answer. They weren't trying to get Jesus to tell them something they didn't already know. They were trying to catch him. But listen, listen to what he replies. Verse 29, Jesus answered, the work of God. Not the works. 
But the work of God is one thing, to believe in the one he sent. So this morning, if you are a Christian, have you believed in the one that has been sent? Have you placed your faith in a Savior to save you because you recognize you can't save yourself? If you have, listen, you have no more business with the law. So stop talking to it. Stop letting it talk to you, right? So let me close with those questions again. Do you feel rejected, guilty, condemned, or unworthy? Remember, condemnation is the number one symptom of the law. Why? Because the law was designed to condemn you. <laughs> so if you're feeling condemned, guess what's happening? You, are, you have somehow placed yourself underneath the law. Well, Dave, what if I sin? That's great. What happened to your sin, even if you sin tomorrow or the next day or the next day or the next day, what about your sin? And the answer for a believer is, my sin has been fully paid for. I am completely complete and perfectly perfect. But I sin. I get it. But are you a sinner? If you don't identify that, if you don't understand that, you will live your identity under the law rather than your, living your identity under a perfect, sinless person. And I know people, like, people start getting nervous when I say, are you sinless? It depends on how you define sinless. If you ask me, have I sinned since I became a believer? Yes. If you ask me, am I sinless? The answer is yes. And that's why it's so easy to get confused. So before the cross, Adam's sin meant condemnation for all men. Romans 5 talks about that. But now, Romans 8 says, there is now no condemnation to those who do the works that God requires. Right? There is no condemnation. So if you're feeling condemned, you have to ask yourself, are you a believer? Have you let the law do its perfect work in you? And if you haven't, good luck with that journey. Keep trying until the law finally has its final word with you or you end up in a place of judgment somewhere. That's the challenge that we all have when we're sharing Christ. I cannot save anybody, neither can you, and we definitely can't save ourselves. Romans 8 talks about that. Before the cross, God held us responsible for our sins, and not even sacrifices could clear a guilty conscience. We're going to talk about the next time we're together. How do you get rid of a guilty conscience? And the answer is, the only thing that can do that is the blood of Jesus. But what if I sin? I'm telling you. What if I sin? Are you a sinner? If the answer is yes, get saved. <laughs> it's not that hard. But if you are a Christian and you're a believer and you sin, what if you did this? Rather than come and let the law condemn you because it has no more work to do in you, because it's already done its work, it's finished, Jesus fulfilled it all, now you are underneath a perfect Savior who's exchanged his righteousness for your sinfulness. And he's given it to you as a gift. You cannot earn it, you did not deserve it, but it's still there and as a gift. How do you respond to the gift as a believer? The answer is you honor it. You love it. You're so thankful for it. How can you be proud when you understand the depths of the sacrifice that Jesus gave for all of us? How can you be proud and arrogant? You can't. How can you not be humble? You, you have to be humble when you realize how much Jesus has done to save you. But you know what you do? You honor it by saying, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. Uh, I'm going to preach into this at some point. But a question I got asked me one time, as a Christian, do you have to ask for forgiveness? You want to you have some fun? Type that into Google. Do I have to ask forgiveness as a Christian, as a believer? Do I have to ask forgiveness for sin? So what do you think the answer is? You can ask for forgiveness all you want. But what are you asking for? If you're, not, if you're asking for something that's going to come to you, has Jesus done all of the work in you? Has he finished his work? And if you're asking for forgiveness, what, do you, what are you thinking? I don't have it. So here's a thought. What if you said, instead of, Lord, please forgive me for that awful thing. Listen, every time you do this, go back and read Hebrews. Every time you do this, what God is saying, anything that you use to try to get forgiveness that wasn't the blood of Jesus, what you're doing, he, Hebrews talks about, is you, you put Jesus to an open shame and you ask him to go to the cross again. The problem with that is, once for all, it's been done, completed, finished, right? Let me finish this. Second question. Do you think working out your salvation means working for your salvation? Jesus' work on the cross, like I said before, was perfectly perfect and completely complete. 
There's nothing else to do. Because of his sacrifice, Hebrews 10 says, you have been made perfect forever. So what does that mean? You have been, past tense, been made mostly right. What do you think perfect means? For how long? Until you sin the next juicy sin? No, forever. Your work is simply to rest in him. Listen to 1, 1 John 4. As he is, talking about Jesus, so are you when? When you get to heaven? Nope. In this world. What if you saw yourself that way? What if, what if maybe for the first time ever you said, Lord, I know you're working, my, I'm working out my salvation. And by that, I don't mean I'm working for it. What I'm doing is I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm a baby growing up into maturity. I'm receiving from you, but never once am I going to enter under condemnation ever again. I choose and I refuse to do that. So are you conscious? And this is a big one. Are you conscious of your debt to God? And the only answer is, what debt? If you, listen, if you are conscious of your debt to God, you look at him and go, God, what great salvation. Oh, Lord, you're so amazing. Oh, Jesus, the sacrifice you've given, you've loved me so deeply. I owe you so much. You ever said that? You ever thought that? Has the enemy ever tried to put that in your head? If you are conscious, conscious of your debt, the only question is, what debt are you conscious of? If you are conscious of any debt, if you're saying, you know what, Lord, I've sinned since I became a believer. What's God say to that? What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? Although he probably doesn't say that. But you understand, right? What does I've sinned have to do with, are you a sinner? It's a really good question. So what debt? You were in debt, but Jesus redeemed you. Listen, Romans 4 brings this out. If the debt had not been met in full by Jesus on the cross, Jesus would not have been risen from the dead. The whole point of Jesus being risen from the dead was that the Father accepted the perfect sacrifice. And now where is he? The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for you. And again, if you don't understand grace, when you read that scripture, what you heard was Jesus is constantly praying for you to be forgiven. And there are whole denominations, and I'm not just talking about Catholics. I'm talking about whole denominations that live out of that foolishness. And all it ever does is it brings them back underneath the law. So think about that. He ever lives. The whole point of him being alive is his life is the intercession for you. The point of him being alive is that everything that was needed to make you right before the Father has already been completed and done. So if you think he bought your debt and now you owe him, you don't understand the gospel. Every good thing in your life is a gift from God. James says that. He gave you his son, his spirit, his life, his righteousness, even the faith that you begin with is a gift to you. So stop trying to repay him for his priceless gifts. Hear me. It's insulting. Just go, Jesus, thank you. Wow, I don't deserve it. Nope, you don't. And the enemy will come and echo those words. You, oh, you're, such, you're so terrible. Am I though? That's not how he sees me, right? So let me finish up with something Watchman Nee said. He says, what does it mean in everyday life to be delivered from the law? At the risk of a little overstatement, I reply... It means that from henceforth, I am going to do nothing whatever for God. One of the greatest pastors, believers that ever lived in modern era said these words. Henceforth, I am going to do nothing whatever for God. Do you think he did some things for God? <laughs> he goes on. I am never again going to try to please him, God. Does that sound like a Christian? Have you ever said that? Lord, I just want to please you. I just want to please you. And the Lord's up there going, what are you talking about? I'm so pleased right now already. What are you talking about? You want to please me. I'm so pleased. But we say those things, right? He goes on. What awful heresy. You cannot possibly mean that. And later on he says this. God's requirements have not altered, but we are not the ones to meet them. In other words, the law hasn't gone away. The Bible says it's not going to be gone away till it's completely finished. It's still doing its work in this season, in this time, in the world, bringing people to their need to, for a Savior. 
And one day, this whole world's going to be wrapped up and the law will be fulfilled and finished finally. Jesus already did it, but people are still making use of the law until they become believers. And then he goes on. He says, praise God. He is the lawgiver on the throne and he is the law keeper in my heart. And that's the picture. That's where he keeps it because he now lives inside of you. And now it's a walk in the spirit, not a walk back underneath the law. And he finishes up. He says, he who gave the law himself keeps it. Isn't that beautiful? He makes the demands, but he also meets them. Jesus has met every demand on our behalf. Now, the only question is, can you rest in that truth and walk differently moving forward? And before I pray for you, I just want to say this. Will you please stop trying? If you're a believer here this morning, would you just stop trying to make God happy? He's happy with you. If you are a believer, you are a son or a daughter, you are loved by him, you, are, you were never loved more or less on the day you got saved, the, the, when you saying, I'm going to try hard for you, God. You ever see kids do that? Dad, I'm just going to make you happy. And you're like, I'm so happy. Why are, you, why are you trying so hard to be a good son when I see you as a good son? Why? Because someone else paid for that. So you can either keep making your house payment or recognize somebody paid off your house and just be thankful. How would you live differently if you believed with everything that's in you that everything you ever owed or ever would owe was already paid for? That's what it means to stop living under the law. Amen? Would you stand with me? Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you that you rescued us from the law. Lord, thank you, first of all, for the law and the work that it did in my heart to show me, Lord, that I could never be good enough, that I was broken, that I was not where I needed to be. Lord, that the life you designed for me, I was not living it the way you designed it, Lord. And I had to see that. So thank you, Lord, for the law and the perfect work it does inside of our hearts to bring us desperately to the end of ourself, Lord, and show us our great need for a great Savior. But Lord, now that I've placed my faith and trust in you, Jesus, thank you that you fulfilled every single call from the law, every single challenge, every single question, every single requirement, Jesus, you paid for it all once and for all, forever done. It is finished on the cross. And now all that I have now is my life in you. Lord, will you teach us how to walk that out, to walk it out knowing you love us, that you never turn your face away from us, even if we've sinned, Lord. That even more, when we need your help in a time of need, that's when the throne of grace makes the most sense. And so, Jesus, would you change the way we think? Would you transform our minds, Lord, to the place where we see you accurately, where we see the law accurately, and we never let the enemy deceive us and walk us back underneath the law again? God, you said that we were made to be free. For freedom's sake, we've been made free. Lord, help us to walk in the freedom that you paid such a heavy price to give us. Take away the guilt, the shame, and the condemnation and put in its place, Lord, a deep thankfulness for your great love and the sense of your pleasure looking at me. Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you've done. In your name we pray, amen. We would love to pray for you this morning. Sorry, Karen, you're gonna do that part. <laughs> Yeah, we would love to just pray for you this morning. We took some time as just a ministry team and really asked the Lord what is in his thoughts and his hearts for you as his beloved. And um, you're going to just see some words come up on the screen. It's some words of knowledge or some pictures. And what we know is that we would love to agree with you. If any of those resonate with you and you would like to have prayer, our ministry team is going to be at the front. We'd like to just ask them to go ahead and come up front. And if none of those words are like, hey, this is not my thing, but you need prayer for something this morning, this is where we come alongside you and pray for the Lord to intervene and to have breakthrough and be a part of what's going on in your life. So um, we just want to say thank you for being with us this morning, and you can come forward. And for the rest of you who are kind of like talking and chatting, just have a great week. God bless you guys. We love you, and we will see you next Sunday.